The Queen has a unique relationship with her eldest child, mother and son, Queen and heir. Charles absolutely adores his mother. It's not an emotionally close relationship, but it is enormously close nonetheless. Bonds between mother and son are crucial. She wasn't always there. Charles's first steps, Charles's first words, Charles's first everything. But this one is critical to the stability and future of the monarchy. It was obviously very hard for the Queen to hold this extraordinarily high-powered job and the responsibilities of motherhood. It's a complex relationship, an all-powerful monarch. This was the monarch taking over and said, I insist on a divorce. I see this is ridiculous. And a frustrated heir. What is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carmel on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. Prince Charles has waited decades to fulfill his destiny. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb. Charles grew up knowing from a very early age that he was one day going to be king. That was something that was drilled into him. But with the crown, there's a catch. Coming to the throne, of course it's what he's been preparing for his whole life, but it will always be tinged with huge sadness because it will mean that his mother is dead. So how has the monarch shaped the man who will be king? Charles will come from a completely new perspective. There'll be a smooth transition, but it will be different. And after decades of his mother's reign, what role has Charles forged for himself? He will be the most prepared monarch that this country has ever had. He is an extraordinary force for good, not just in this country, but around the world. Elizabeth II is queen to the nation, but to her four children, she is first and foremost a mother. At the age of 94, she is relying on them more than ever. And one in particular has begun to step out from her shadow, her eldest son, Prince Charles. He has more recently been known as the Shadow King because he's been taking on many more of the duties and responsibilities. We see him laying the nation's wreath at the Cenotaph. He is taking on some of the aspects of kingship for the future that is to come. The first child of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip, baby Charles was always destined to be king. On the 14th of November, 1948, he was born Charles Philip Arthur George and instantly became second in line to the throne. His Royal Highness makes his debut before the cameras. His father's delight in his young son is plain to see. They could actually be like a normal family. That's what the Queen kept saying to her friends. You know, I just want to bring him up as normally as possible. But of course, we know that it's impossible to bring up a royal child normally. He was given the title His Royal Highness Prince Charles of Edinburgh. And at four weeks old, his parents had him christened in the music room at Buckingham Palace. As the pictures clearly show, he paid no heed to the filming, remaining perfectly calm while the cameras produced the records we've all been so anxious to see. And when the filming was over, along came Nurse Rowe to put His Royal Highness to bed. Biographer Angela Levin, who spent a year following the Prince of Wales in 2018, has since viewed this footage as an early sign of the challenges the Queen would face as a first-time royal mother. You would think that it would be such an emotional moment, here's the heir to the throne, that she would absolutely want to spend some private time with him, holding him, caressing him, maybe even shed a tear, but no, the Queen had to maintain her dignity. It's not that she loved him less, it's just that she most certainly would not show it in public because it wasn't the dumb thing to do. 
In 1951, King George VI, Elizabeth's beloved father, passed away. At just 25, she became queen. Signs of the deep mourning into which the nation had been plunged were to be seen everywhere. We all believed that his health had been improving, a fact that added weight to the blow when it fell. At the time of Elizabeth's accession, she also had a two-year-old daughter, Anne. But the spotlight was on three-year-old Charles, now heir to the throne. The dutiful queen soon felt the harsh realities of being both a monarch and a mother. When the Queen came to the throne, it was a man's world. The 1950s, post-war, there was a real demand for women to go back to the home. Even though women were working, this is a problem because the Queen, she is head of state and she also has two children, so there are a lot of demands upon her. If you had children and you had a career, you pretty much had to pretend they almost didn't exist because that was the job of a wife. She actually eventually moved her Prime Minister's meeting to the evening rather than earlier so she could see her children, which didn't happen very often. But if she wasn't busy, she would sit by the bath and play with her children. Queen Elizabeth's coronation took place in June 1953 in a lavish ceremony at Westminster Abbey. Charles was just four at the time, but more than half a century later, speaking for his mother's 80th birthday, he could still remember that day. I have vivid memories of the coronation, of my mother coming to say goodnight to my sister and me while wearing the crown so that she could get used to its weight on her head before the coronation ceremony, of thousands of people gathered in the mall outside Buckingham Palace chanting, we want the queen, and uh, keeping me awake at night. He was very excited and he'd been promised a party with all his friends after the coronation. So the Queen came to say hello to all his friends in the upper rooms of Buckingham Palace after the coronation. She came in in all her finery and her robes. Footage from soon afterwards showed the new monarch successfully balancing motherhood with her royal duties. Many carefree and touching moments were caught on camera during summers at Balmoral. It became a sort of wonderful time for the children there. They loved the open spaces. They could run, they could horse ride. They also used to do an awful lot of barbecues with Prince Philip being in charge of the barbecue. But the Queen was fiercely dedicated to her new role even if that meant spending long periods of time away from her young son. She wasn't always there as and when she would have liked to. Charles's first steps, Charles's first words, Charles's first everything took place when she was abroad doing her duty. The Queen's dedication to her royal role, particularly in those early years, had an inevitable impact on her family life and the bond with her young son. Growing up, there wasn't a particularly close relationship between Charles and his mother. And I think probably on, on more occasions than not, he probably looked at her as the Queen rather than his mother. It was probably quite difficult to distinguish between the two different roles. While away on royal duties, the Queen, like her own mother, would rely on outside help to raise her children. The nannies did most of the care, if not all of the care, and he lived with the nannies on the nursery floor at Buckingham Palace. Really, it was the nannies that were closer to him than anybody else. These female figures would become significant to Charles throughout his life. Scottish nanny, Helen Lightbody, worked for the family between 1948 and 1956. Prince Charles liked her very much, but I think here was the first sign that the Queen was a little bit jealous because she thought she was, one, she was too stern, but also the Queen had chosen a rather delicious dessert for Prince Charles to have that day. 
and she decided he couldn't have it. Perhaps it was too sugary, we're not told. And the Queen was so cross. Now, if that isn't a sort of, I know what's best for my little boy, I don't know what else is. Mabel Anderson, or Mipsy, as she'd become affectionately known, started as a royal nanny in 1949. Grant Harold met her many years later while working as butler to the Prince of Wales. I found her absolutely terrifying, not because she was, she was very polite, she was friendly, but she was a traditional nanny. I mean, very much a Mary Poppins to my mind, but he was very close to her. You can see there's a very close bond. Another crucial maternal figure in the young prince's life was his grandmother. The Queen Mother. Uh, who he's referred to as magical, his magical grandmother with whom he had his closest family relationship because it was the Queen Mother that he could go to for hugs and encouragement and praise. These figures around the young prince nurtured him and offered the support his parents often couldn't provide. Even though the Queen and Prince Philip were not around for a lot of the time, he had an amazing support network of these surrogate parental figures in his life that I think have shaped him and made him the man he is today. In November 1953, the Queen and Prince Philip set off on a six-month tour of the Commonwealth. After the stay in Fiji came the visit to Tonga, and here, as you'd certainly expect, an outstanding welcome was in readiness for the royal travellers. Five-year-old Charles and Anne, who was just two, were left behind in the care of their nannies. It was obviously very hard for the Queen to hold this extraordinarily high-powered job and the responsibilities of motherhood. Years later, Charles recalled the lack of contact and the struggles of being thousands of miles away from his parents for so long. My parents being away for long overseas tours during the 1950s and of determined attempts to speak to them on the telephone in far distant lands when all you could hear was the faintest of voices in a veritable storm of crackling and static interference. I'm sure he had no idea why his mother was away so much. Children can't possibly understand these things. But we do know from what he said later to his official biographer, Jonathan Dimbleby, that he did resent the absences, that he was hurt by them. After six months apart, Charles and Anne sailed out on the Royal Yacht Britannia to join their parents. For the royal children beginning their voyage to the Mediterranean, this must have been easily the most thrilling day of their lives. But a still more thrilling one lay ahead, the day when they would reach Tobruk and see their mother and father again. But the long-awaited reunion appeared to be rather restrained. Prince Charles was four or five, I think, and she just shook his hand. The Queen was so much the Queen at that time that she couldn't slip into being the mother when she came back. The Queen said that they were terribly polite. I don't think they really knew who we were. For the Queen, that must have been terribly hard. In recent years, the Prince has opened up about his mother's absence during his childhood. He's spoken since about the fact that he found his parents emotionally reserved, that he was yearning for a sort of affection from them that they were unable or unwilling to give. They weren't the people to whom he could turn for that. Prince Charles was left out of the feelings of, uh, that most children really need when they're part of a family. It's taken him, I think, decades to get over it. But the Prince's candor about his mother may have pushed them further apart. The Queen really cares about being a mother. And some of the complaints that have been made about her parenting style, many of which have come from Prince Charles over the years, have, I think, hurt her really badly. If Charles's early childhood was a challenge, life was about to get even tougher. His school years were filled with distress. And there were lots of stories how he would, you know, clutch his teddy bear at night time and cry himself to sleep. And drama. For someone who was so shy, to be told this in front of his schoolmates was intensely mortifying.
The Queen's decisions about young Charles would become vital to the future stability of the monarchy. The Queen was just 27 when she was crowned. Her experience of being a young monarch meant she wasted no time preparing Charles for kingship. There was every expectation that the same might happen to Charles as had happened to the Queen. They had to be ready for any eventuality. So Charles was being trained, if you like. Charles grew up knowing from a very early age that he was one day going to be king. That was something that was drilled into him. There was extra schooling, and that was the mentoring from his mother, the preparation um, to one day become sovereign. The queen had first-hand experience as an heir, but it was Prince Philip who seemed determined to take the lead on Charles's development. The queen was the head of the Commonwealth, uh, the number one uh, person in the country, but Prince Philip was the head of the family. Prince Philip was a, a good father. He read to him, he opened his eyes to the countryside. He loved the physical side of, of being a father, the rough and tumble of it all. The Duke, who'd served as a Navy commander, took a no-nonsense approach with his son. Prince Philip was almost a bully to him and uh, criticised him and because in his view a boy or a man, young man you know liked rugby and football and cricket they weren't interested in nature um, and butterflies and talking to flowers. He did think Charles was a bit of a wimp. Charles was very shy, he was sensitive. Both the Queen and Prince Philip worried about him and they were concerned about him being a slow developer, whether he would have the resilience and sort of hardiness of character uh, to face the life of duty that would be in front of him. He really was a bit of a whiner. He was always whinging and whining as a child, as a teenager, in his 20s, even into his 30s. If Charles was around, the moan was not far behind. Prince Philip had very set ideas about Charles's education. The Queen had been privately tutored, but the Duke wanted him to experience life outside palace walls. It was Philip who put his foot down about the kind of schooling that Charles was to have. They realized that he had to mix with, with, with other boys of his age. Um, he had to have a, a broader outlook. In 1957, he followed in his father's footsteps and started at Cheen, the oldest private school in the country. Charles was absolutely miserable in Cheen, and there are lots of stories how he would, you know, clutch his teddy bear at night time and cry himself to sleep. He was a target because he was the heir to the throne. It was while he was at Cheen, the complex relationship with his mother intensified. It was announced he would become the Prince of Wales, and Charles heard the news alongside the rest of the school. The headmaster had um, encouraged Charles and some of the boys to come into his study to watch the closing of the Empire Games, as they were then called, in Wales. He made this announcement that, um, that Charles henceforth would be uh, Prince of Wales. I intend to create my son Charles, Prince of Wales, today. When he has grown up, I will present him to you at Carnarvon. Every heir to the throne has been the Prince of Wales since 1301. It couldn't have come as a surprise, but the way it was announced would have surely been a shock. And for someone who was so shy, to be told this in front of his schoolmates was intensely mortifying. And it's one of those moments that marked what he's later called um, the inexorable dawning of the sense that he would one day be king. Charles's formative years at public school lay ahead. Again, the Queen deferred to her husband to decide where Charles would go, in spite of what she might have thought. I think the Queen would have very much liked to have sent Prince Charles to Eton, but she liked to give Philip the right to choose all these things, so she wanted him to feel that he was in control of this, helping Charles become a good heir um, before he became king. 
Philip had flourished at Gordonston in Scotland, and he was keen for his son to follow the same path. I think at that point it was quite damaging really for the relationship between father and son because Charles resented Philip for sending him away, sending him away from his family and Charles was very unhappy for much of his time there. They have the windows open throughout the winter, it's freezing cold, they had to go for runs very early in the morning and um, Prince Charles absolutely hated it. He felt he was in prison. Um, he felt incredibly homesick. He didn't fit in very well. He was bullied because his ears stuck out. My husband was in the same class as him at Gordonston. So he's told me some, some very sad stories, actually, about Charles A. But he was very much alone. He used to take books of sonnets and go down by one of the streams there and read sonnets. Well, any boy that does that is going to get teased. He was kind of an oddball. The Queen and Prince Philip did visit him. They, they visited him more than, than, than I think he gave credit for. Charles's experience at Gordonston was nothing like his father's. He famously called the school Colditz in kilts, comparing it to a German prisoner of war camp. Being a monarch is a tough thing. It's not about what you like. It's about putting up with what you don't like. And you know, the proof of the pudding is, is in the eating. Maybe if he'd been moved to school, maybe if he'd been given a cushier life, he wouldn't have turned out with the great guy that he has turned out to be. Charles went on to study at Cambridge University and would become the first heir to the throne to get a degree. It was at Cambridge that he finally found his voice. He settled in there quite well. Most of all, he loved um, going on stage and he appeared in lots of shows. All alone on the, the, in a deep sea fishing boat with just my rod and line, the great unknown, a few helicopters and, and uh, some ASDIC, but yes, I do believe I've got a bite. I have a bite. He said it was so enjoyable and he had a very, very good time there. But he was wrenched away in his second year to go and spend a term in Wales because of the investiture coming up. I think I've got quite a large one here. It's, it's really, very large indeed. I, I, I... Duty called and Charles was required to perform on a very different kind of stage. He would be invested by his mother as the Prince of Wales at a time when the British government felt threatened by a resurgent Welsh nationalist movement. Charles Philip Arthur George, the 21st Prince of Wales, drives through the streets of ancient Carnarvon for his investment. One minute he's a carefree student in Cambridge and the next minute he's being asked to fulfil this very complicated, very difficult diplomatic role. On the 1st of July, 1969, his investiture ceremony took place at Carnarvon Castle, the birthplace of the first English Prince of Wales. At the bidding of his queen, the bareheaded prince comes forward. Really, looking back, seems an incredible amount to ask of such a young man. You know, you can see the sort of nervousness in Charles's face that he has to play this whole medieval role in the investiture. Charles was determined to deliver for the public, but most importantly, his mother. Charles, being heir apparent, was always going to be an absolutely pivotal moment in his life. The coronet for sovereignty. You can clearly see how, how proud the Queen is of her son, and particularly when he delivers his speech in Welsh, thus establishing an early and genuine connection with the Welsh people, which would have been incredibly important, not just to him, but also to his mother. That investiture gave the world its first proper glimpse of the relationship between mother and son. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, to become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. There was a very powerful link between them at that moment. 
they had to look into each other's eyes. It was very moving, I think. If you look at the Queen herself, you can see the pride, actually, I think, in her eyes. He was devoted to his mother from the very beginning. But this is a, a formal moment at which to acknowledge, to be her liege man of life and limb, it's quite something. And I think it was a very moving moment for him. You don't see the devotion very often. And I think, I think in that ceremony, you actually did. Charles absolutely adores his mother. It's not a physically close relationship or an emotionally close one, but it is enormously close nonetheless. And Charles is almost in awe of his mother. The Queen had never been prouder of her son, the heir. But in later years, it was his love life taking center stage. And it sent the press, public, and his parents into a frenzy. The monarchy was going through a really, really rocky time. What Charles and Diana were doing by being at war with one another was splitting the country. When it came to romance, it was never going to be easy for Charles. As future king, his partners were not only expected to meet the approval of his mother, the queen, but also conform to centuries of royal tradition. The heir to the British throne had to marry someone who wasn't a Catholic, who was an aristocrat or was royal, and who had no past, who, was, who had to be a virgin. I mean, this was grotesquely outdated. But it was this that was a burden on Charles. He felt that his family would disprove if he strayed from them. There was no shortage of candidates for the role. There were lots of women, of course, who wanted to date him. He was really seen as the most eligible bachelor in, in the world, really. He liked very glamorous women. He, there were all sorts of rumors about him having a relationship with various um, singers. There were often pictures when he was young in his 20s where he was pictured on various holidays with various glamorous bikini clad women. I don't think the Queen was entirely comfortable with Charles's reputation as a playboy. Like it would be embarrassing for any mum, I guess, but especially so when you're Queen. Charles dated a number of women from aristocratic backgrounds, but one stood out from the rest. Charles met uh, Camilla, um, then Camilla Shan. They met at a polo match, and there was an instant connection between them. But she did come with baggage, perhaps more baggage than, than the royal family wanted a future Princess of Wales to have. She had had quite a, a colourful private life before, and she'd had a serious boyfriend before, Andrew Parker Bowles. Charles was very keen on her, but there was no question of them getting married because she was not regarded as being of sufficiently grand background to marry the Prince of Wales. It appeared the Crown, and specifically the Queen, was threatening to come between Charles and the potential love of his life. Prince Charles would have found it absolutely difficult, and I suspect he was angry about the fact that his mother, the Queen, was disapproving of Camilla. The Queen has to wear two hats. The Queen has to be Queen, and she's also a mother. As a mother, she'd obviously want whatever is good for her son. As Queen at that time, she has to consider the impact upon the monarchy, and, and really, there was no way that Camilla would be accepted at that particular time. The hunt for a suitable wife went on and on and on and on. And people were getting very worried. The papers were always full of it. You know, when will the air settle down? The headlines began to change in 1980 when Charles started dating Lady Diana Spencer. Diana, you know, would have been pretty much perfect for the palace. I mean, she was a young, beautiful bride. Her father, Earl Spencer, and the Spencers generally had been associated with royalty for many, many years. In many ways, it was a behind the scenes, a bit arranged, really. 
the Queen, the Queen Mother, the rest of the royal family, they all approved wholeheartedly of Diana. They thought that she was absolutely ideal. Charles was now not only under pressure from the press, but also from his mother. There came a point when I think he probably got a nudge from the Queen who was saying, you know, is there going to be a point when you're going to settle down? Because you're going to need to. After a whirlwind romance, the couple were married in what was dubbed a fairy tale wedding at St Paul's Cathedral. The wedding of Charles and Diana in so many ways eclipsed all the royal weddings that have happened since in terms of its, its glamour and its interest. And the Princess Diana really was the fairy tale princess. The Queen was, of course, really happy. You know, her firstborn son, the heir of the future king, is marrying and marrying somebody that she approves of, marrying somebody who comes from the right family. A proud mother later became a doting grandmother to Charles and Diana's two sons, Princes William and Harry. But this was no fairy tale. It was many years into the prince's marriage to Diana before his mother or his father really knew what was going on. They didn't realize how unhappy Charles was. As heir to the throne, the stability of the monarchy rested on Charles's shoulders, something his mother was keenly aware of. He felt so in awe and he felt he'd let down his parents so much. And they talked with Prince Philip and her, and she was saying to them, please try not to do this, be less selfish, and think what you can do with the monarchy. And here this is very important, because here we see the mother-in-law, the mother, being the monarch that actually she felt that the most important thing was not to disrupt the monarchy, not to shake it about. But Charles went public with his marital problems, making an unprecedented and historic appearance in a candid documentary in 1994. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. I think the Queen was hurt by the whole Dimbleby exercise. Dimbleby wrote a book as well as, as, well as um, doing the interview. Charles surrendered all his letters and diaries, so all his private thoughts were in the book and his private thoughts about his upbringing and his relationship with his parents. And I think the Queen was very hurt to hear that Charles didn't feel he was sufficiently loved by his parents. And as for the admission of adultery, I think she, she just felt it was the most terrible mistake and he should never have done it. But the Queen's troubles over Charles's marriage were far from over. After Charles's very public revelations, Diana hit back months later with this explosive and highly revealing interview on BBC's Panorama. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. The so-called War of the Waleses had begun. Diana talked about the fact that she had uh, suffered depression after the birth of her children, that she had been self-harming, that she'd felt isolated in the royal family, she'd had bulimia, um, and that Charles had committed adultery. And she also confessed her own adultery with James Hewitt. 23 million people thereabouts watched it. It was sort of dominating royal coverage. It was overshadowing all the good works of the royal family. And they thought it was sort of corroding public attitudes towards the House of Windsor, and it was a very damaging time for the Queen. I mean, the monarchy was going through a really, really rocky time because monarchy is supposed to be all about unifying the country, and what Charles and Diana were doing by being at war with one another was splitting the country. The marriage problems of Charles and Diana have cast a shadow over the royal family. Now the Queen has decided to bring the whole issue to a head by advising them to divorce. This was the monarch 
taking over, not so much the mother or the mother-in-law, and said, I insist on a divorce. I see this is ridiculous. It's not going to work with being separated. They had to divorce. The breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage had put strain on the monarchy and the queen's relationship with her son, but nothing could prepare them for what would happen next. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. The death of Diana and the events surrounding it and the, over those seven days between her death and her funeral were one of the most pivotal moments in the queen's career as monarch. I mean, for the very first time, she found herself under attack from her subjects. It became an international matter. It became a political matter. I mean, it involved the prime minister, the leader of the opposition. I mean, everyone had a view and opinion. There were stories of differences when Princess Diana's coffin was returned to RAF Northolt. It was said the Queen wanted her body to go to a private mortuary and that she opposed a public funeral. Those and other rumours were today declared by the Queen's spokesman to be quite wrong. The Queen's reaction was to be a grandmother to William and Harry, reassuring them, being there for them. It was almost the 11th hour when the Queen came back to speak to the country from Buckingham Palace. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. The words were powerful. Charles was hugely involved in that. And I think it was a key moment between mother and son, uh, one of the key moments um, of their entire relationship. But their complex relationship did not make it easy for Charles when he found happiness with Camilla Parker Bowles. After Diana, she was banned from the palace for a while, Camilla, because this, this, this woman who had cheated with her son on her then husband, who was Andrew Parker Bowles, was the Queen Mother's godson. So the Queen did not want her around, not at all. There was real animosity from the Queen towards Camilla. She called her a wicked woman. She refused to see her. And that continued for a very long time after Diana's death. It's not just Charles's love life that has caused rifts between him and his mother over the years. The Queen has always kept her views to herself, but Charles hasn't always followed her example. We know Prince Charles's views on virtually every subject under the sun. What's gonna happen when he becomes king? At 71 years old, Prince Charles is the longest serving heir apparent in British history. When he takes over from his mother, he will be the oldest king ever crowned. He knows one day he will be king, but he'll only be king on the death of his mother. We all know realistically that she's not going to go on and on and on, but we do hope that she'll go on for quite a few more years yet. Until then, Charles has had to carve out a role for himself. You know that. The fact that Prince Charles is labelled as having been a king in waiting for most of his life doesn't mean that he is disaffected with the role that he has had. He has had a golden opportunity which he has grasped of creating a very expanded role for the Prince of Wales. Charles's actions and words have left the world in no doubt about many of his opinions, making it quite apparent that despite both being destined to reign, he and his mother are very different people. Charles, you know, expresses himself um, much more emotionally than the Queen ever does. He cries at pieces of music. He loves the ballet, he loves opera. The Queen doesn't really share all those things with him. He's also a cultivated man. He, you know, he's a painter. He, he uh, paints watercolours, uh, quite good ones actually. He likes gardening, he likes classical music. I mean, he reads widely. He is a man who has educated himself widely and is therefore quite wise. And although we don't know whether the Queen accords with any of these interests, her interests tend to be more sort of horses and um, dogs. The Queen has always been very thrifty. 
you know, we've seen her breakfast table with Tupperware boxes on it, and we've seen her three bar electric fire that heats her palaces. Prince Charles is very different. He leads a much more extravagant lifestyle. He loves luxury. He likes things being just right. It's not just their interests and personalities that differ. Charles and the Queen are very different or in one particular way, which is that the Queen has been a model of discretion. Uh, we don't know her political views. She has kept a determinedly neutral stance whereas we do know quite a lot of the political views of Prince Charles. The difference is that the Queen has always kept her feelings to herself, whereas Prince Charles doesn't hold back. Do you think it matters that we have 20% of children who never get out to see scenes like this? That is wor worrying, I think, and so it, it helps enormously, I believe, if children can have this connection by growing something. It's often said that the mantra of the royal family is never complain, never explain. This has been the Queen's approach for nearly 70 years. But she is the monarch and Charles is not. Until he takes the crown, he's had a different approach to his mother. He has intervened, perhaps most famously, of course, on, on architecture and he gave a series of very dramatic uh, speeches in which he pretty much spelled out his opposition to modern architecture. But what is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. He's probably said the sort of things that we would say, but nobody would take any notice. He was instrumental in the extension to the National Gallery, and what there is now is very pleasing. He was instrumental in getting the plans for Paternoster Square around St Paul's Cathedral changed. Uh, and it's terrific round there. Can you imagine half the horrendous tower blocks we would have had in this country had Prince Charles not put his foot down? I mean, modern British architecture in England is pretty pathetic. And I say that as somebody who studied art for 11 years. From architecture to the environment, Prince Charles has never hidden his thoughts and opinions. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our time. We know Prince Charles's views on virtually every subject under the sun. What's gonna happen when he becomes king? Is he suddenly going to adopt some sort of monastic silence and sit on the fence? Prince Charles has been somewhat of a visionary. Uh, he's talked about the dangers of plastic in seas, the environment, keeping nature alive and well, which is not any of the things that particularly interests the Queen. They're very diverse on that. What if the people don't like what they see? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Those opinions have not only made him an outspoken Prince of Wales, but according to some, also affected his relationship with his parents, particularly his mother. He annoyed his parents. Actually, they felt he was weak. They felt they couldn't trust him to be king, that he had all these funny ideas about spiritualism and plastic in the sea. Increasingly, people start talking about Charles as a bit eccentric. There are cartoons of him talking to his plants and thinking too much about his plants. But perhaps most controversially, Prince Charles has waded into the world of politics. Over the years, he's written numerous letters to government ministers and politicians, something his mother would never do. Well, the Queen has always kept her feelings very private, particularly any political feelings. You know, we have had a greater insight into the workings of the mind of the Prince of Wales, largely down to letters that he hand wrote to MPs. They became known as the Black Spider Memos because his very distinctive, long, spidery writing, he would quite often take ministers to task privately about many issues. As monarch-in-waiting, Charles has used his role to find a voice. I think throughout his life, Charles has demonstrated an extraordinary ability to care about things that matter. So he cares very much about sustainability, about uh, climate change issues, ocean pollution, deforestation. 
And it's important that somebody in a key position takes an interest in that because they take an interest and other people will listen. People in power will listen. People in government will listen. The Prince of Wales has used his position as king in waiting to actually have a very effective role constitutionally. <laughs> but that's not something the Queen has approved of. Well, I understand that the Queen has viewed his interventions with, with unease on occasions. She doesn't feel that it is the place of the royal family to take a lead on matters which could be interpreted as political or policy making. When Charles eventually does become king, will he reign more like his mother before him? She has been extremely measured over the years. And where Prince Charles has not been, but then their roles have been radically different. Prince Charles has given private assurances that when he's king, he will not medal, she knows he will make a good king. King in a different way from how she was queen, but they are very different people, and they represent different times. While his mother is still monarch, the role Charles has made for himself does share one key trait with the queen. I think for the, for the queen, Everything is about duty. Duty comes first, and that goes back to a bygone time. There's no manual about how a Prince of Wales should spend his life, and in fact, previous Princes of Wales have frittered their time away. Charles has always had a really keen sense of duty. He's been very driven by public service. He carved out this role as a sort of activist Prince of Wales all for himself. No one who's occupied the title has ever done it before. And I think the Queen was very supportive of all his many initiatives. She's praised his work with the Prince's Trust, for example, on several occasions. The Prince's Trust is a charity founded by Charles. It supports 11 to 30 year olds who are unemployed and those struggling at school. He cares passionately about, about people, about the people who one day he will reign over. He cares about their living conditions, he cares about their future, about the future for their children, and he's got a finger in absolutely every pie and has made life so much better for so many millions of people the world over. I don't think he's been doing that to impress his mother. I think he's been doing it because he actually genuinely cares. There are those royals that turn up at their charity event. They just show up, smile, and wave a hand. Prince Charles is different. He is very passionate about the charities that he works with. He knows so much about them. He's very, very involved with them. As well as being a hugely successful charity, the Prince's Trust has also served as an opportunity for a proud mother to publicly reward her son. In 1999, the charity was presented with a royal charter. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organization. The Prince of Wales may have been waiting an extraordinarily long time to take the crown, but for many, this period of waiting has been a benefit. He will be the best prepared monarch that this country has ever had. And he has spent his time in waiting doing really, really good things. He is an extraordinary force for good, not just in this country, but around the world. He has done tremendous sterling work across the board. He has taken full advantage of the fact that he has a very eminent position of influence when he actually had the freedom to intervene. Because, of course, once he becomes monarch, he has to be scrupulously neutral, which is not something that came naturally to him. And I suspect when he looks back on his life, he's going to realize that it was not a poison chalice. Charles only became Prince of Wales because he was the first-born son and heir to the Queen. Elizabeth is, of course, mother to three other royals. She really was able 
to be a mother to them in a way that it, it was completely denied to her with Charles. Whereas Prince Charles, you know, grew up knowing that one day I will be the next king, whereas the other three could just relax into it, go to school, um, in one sense have as much of a normal childhood as one could possibly have in the royal family, but I think much more than Prince Charles himself. As the Queen's first son and heir, Charles has always had a different relationship with his mother than those of his brothers and sisters. So how did his childhood compare to his younger siblings? Anne, Andrew, and Edward. Charles was a very introverted little boy. He was very unconfident and withdrawn. And I think that his father, in particular, was worried that he wasn't manly enough. Compared with his sister, Princess Anne, who was two years younger than Charles, was a much tougher, more resilient character. She was much more of an extrovert, just very happy in her own skin. She had a great relationship with her father. They were both very opinionated. And so I suspect Prince Charles looked at that thinking, oh, I wish I had just a little bit of that in me. The Queen is well known for her love of horses. From an early age, Princess Anne shared her mother's passion for all things equestrian, helping to strengthen their relationship to the possible exclusion of Charles. Princess Anne and the Queen bonded over their love of horses, where Prince Charles, maybe at a younger age, didn't show the same enthusiasm or interest. The Queen did teach Charles to ride, but he wasn't a natural like Anne, and that gave Anne and, and the Queen an, an opportunity to ride out together and to bond over that love of, of riding. He didn't have that same maternal bond with the Queen that Anne enjoyed. By the time the Queen gave birth to her third child, Prince Andrew, in 1960, Charles was already away at boarding school. Opportunities for him to bond with his siblings and parents were limited to school holidays. I don't think Charles had much of a, a relationship with his siblings as he was growing up because he was very rarely there. So he just didn't see them. He didn't have much of a relationship with them as they were born quite a long time after him. So he's never been close to them. With Charles spending weeks at a time away at boarding school, the Queen was able to devote more time to her younger sons than she had with him. Don't forget that when she came to the throne, she was young, she was handling an enormous set of new responsibilities being sovereign, and of course, coming to terms with motherhood and all of the challenges that entailed. If she hadn't had to become queen, she would have you know, spent a lot more time with Charles as she did with Andrew and Edward. She would get involved with their education, she went to every single school play. She really was able to be a mother to them in a way that it was completely denied to her with Charles. As future monarch, Charles's childhood differed in one other crucial respect compared to his siblings. Prince Charles grew up knowing that one day I will be the next king, whereas the other three could just relax into it, go to school, have as much of a normal childhood as one could possibly have in the royal family, but I think much more than Prince Charles himself. He knew he was different. He was different by his birthright. He was the only one who was born heir apparent. And I think that sense of burden and responsibility rested quite heavily, even on very young shoulders, and just that sense of knowing that he was different. While the Queen has never admitted to having a favorite child, one of her sons is rumored to hold a higher place in her affections. I think the Queen absolutely has a favourite and, and I think it's Andrew and there's a very good reason for that. Andrew was called the love child in the royal family because the Queen and, and the Duke were having rumoured problems in their marriage. The Queen's complex relationship with her eldest son Charles has led many to speculate how it affected his own approach to parenting. I think at first when Prince Charles became a father he left a lot of the parenting to Princess Diana, and we can see that, the hugging, the laughing, the cuddling that she did. But when Diana died, Charles had to become mum and dad. 
After her death, it changes completely, and he is very hands-on for those boys and knows that he has to be. He really stepped up that parenting role when he needed to. As Prince Charles's former butler, Grant Harold has witnessed his parenting style up close. He is a fantastic parent, very caring, loving, uh, considerate. As far as where his parenting styles came from, she would have given him some pointers and advice. As a grandmother herself, the Queen now favours a more hands-on role than she did as mum to Charles. The Queen adores all her grandchildren and she, she, uh, she treats them all equally. Maybe William and Harry a little bit more equal than the others. The Queen has always been there for William and Harry. She has an incredibly close relationship with them, as she does with all of her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. And one of the greatest joys and, and sources of pleasure in her life now are spending time with, with her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, something that she didn't get to do perhaps as much of as she would have liked when she was a mother because she was busy being queen. Just as she has mentored Charles to become king, the Queen has also passed on her decades of experience as monarch to his eldest son and heir, William. The relationship between William and the Queen is very strong because, you know, she appreciates that one day he'll be king. And so he, you know, she will, you know, help him along the way, understanding the way things work. Prince Charles has long been the monarch in waiting, but as the Queen gets older, he's increasingly exerting his authority with Camilla by his side. Never more so than when Andrew, the Queen's alleged favorite, caused a scandal because of his friendship with convicted sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein. Charles's increasing influence became evident during the This now infamous BBC interview watched by millions. Do you regret the whole friendship with Epstein? Um, I, now, I, I still not. The truth is, it's difficult for a mother to act decisively necessarily with someone that she loves. And with Prince Andrew, maybe she was relying too much on what he was telling her about the Epstein scandal. While the Queen previously had called the shots, for Charles, enough was enough. This time, it was his turn to put monarchy before family. Charles and Camilla were in New Zealand at the time of Prince Andrew's interview. And I think Charles, would, like everybody else, he was absolutely horrified. And I think he felt he should take over here. Um, and so he, he rang his mother and, uh, and he said to her, you know, Prince Andrew's my brother, but he cannot be allowed to behave like this. The Queen was guided by Charles, and I think that episode particularly illustrates just how involved Charles now is in the daily workings of the monarchy. You know, he does have a leading role, and he is more powerful now than he ever has been. Buckingham Palace released a statement saying that Prince Andrew was to relinquish his royal patronages. Charles had effectively fired his younger brother as a senior member of the firm. He saw that Andrew had no option but to withdraw from public duty and 
and absolutely pull back from all his official engagements. And he made that clear that that is what he expected his brother to do. Charles was now calling the shots and he had to do what he was told. Throughout her reign, the queen has served the country dutifully. But when the time comes for Charles to take over, is the future of the monarchy secure? There was a period uh, when the queen was concerned about the succession of the House of Windsor. The relationship between the Queen and her eldest son and heir, Prince Charles, is vital to the future stability of the monarchy. Charles has spent practically his whole life as next in line to the throne. But as the Queen approaches her mid-90s, she has finally started to hand over some of her official duties. Well, I would say for the last decade or so, the Prince of Wales' influence at the heart of the monarchy it has been growing. We are actually in a transition period now, and in that transition period, the Prince has growing influence because, of course, he is the next king. In many ways, in this transition, uh, the Queen will defer to the Prince of Wales on many issues. Really, things started to change after 2012. After the Queen's Jubilee, she said that she didn't want to do so much of the foreign travel anymore, so Charles took on a lot of her foreign travel. The Duke of Edinburgh is now retired, so Charles is increasingly seeing himself as both the Queen's main representative and also head of the family. You can really see more and more this wonderful relationship between Queen and Prince that's evolved over 71 years and counting and getting stronger and stronger by the minute. We see him at the state opening of Parliament in 2019. We see him laying the nation's wreath at the Cenotaph for a couple of years in, in a row on the annual Remembrance Day. And there's a sense in which he is stepping up, that he is taking on some of the aspects of kingship for the future that is to come. When Prince Charles recently became ill with coronavirus, he took the opportunity to reach out to the country in this moving video released by Clarence House. I think everybody was very impressed with his message uh, after having contracted coronavirus. As we're all learning, this is a strange, frustrating and often distressing experience when the presence of family and friends is no longer possible. They were very upset that he got it uh, and then he came out of it, uh, that he opened by video link the Nightingale Hospital. This dark time, this place will be a shining light. And people have, a, have quite a soft spot for him. Over the last few years, there's been press speculation that the Queen may one day decide to abdicate, but most royal insiders believe she won't give up the crown. Prince Charles knows that the Queen will never abdicate, just as how Barring some great misfortune, he will never abdicate. We know that at times she has said that other people can give up their jobs, like the Archbishop of Canterbury, but she must stay in it until she dies. God gave her the job and only God can take it away. But some royal experts think that the Queen's age may eventually force her to step down from her day-to-day -day duties as monarch. Charles would become Prince Regent, king in all but name. If a monarch is incapable of doing their duty, then the heir can take over and do all the duties that the monarch would do. And there was rumors that the queen might stand down uh, when she's 95, but actually she seems so strong and confident that she might just carry on. Your Excellency. Throughout her nearly seven decades as monarch, the Queen has steadfastly avoided controversy. As Prince of Wales, Charles has been more forthright with his public opinions. But that could all change. He knows that he will not be able to make these sort of pronouncements once he becomes king, that he would have to draw back from being a vocal opponent to various things. I think we've seen that recently 
when he went to Jerusalem and to Palestine and the occupied territories. And he showed the statesman like role there. Very delicate political situation, but one that he dealt with very well. For decades, we've been used to Charles speaking out on all manners of things, from the environment and conservation and all sorts of other issues. Today, the Northwest Passage is becoming a deeply worrying reality as the results of human activity warm even this remote ocean. It's unlikely he'll be able to make those dramatic speeches that he has in, in the past, but he'll still communicate with ministers, but it might have to be done a bit more subtly. After the struggles of his childhood, Charles has now finally become accepting of his mother. While the Queen, who has long worried about him, now knows the monarchy is in safe hands. There was a period uh, when the Queen was concerned about the future, but the feeling now is that the succession of the House of Windsor is secure. The Queen knows that in her son she has a very stable, certain, confident future king. I think he's learned a lot from his 71 years of life. He's also had to follow uh, the footsteps of the greatest queen this country has ever seen. And he has her as his role model. The queen and Prince Charles's relationship is better than ever. But as king, could he ever command the same degree of affection from the British public as his mother? Some people don't really like Prince Charles and um, they still stand up for the late Princess of Wales. But I think that the majority of people have come round to thinking he's been much underrated and he actually could do a good job as king. As time goes on, Charles is definitely getting more popular because people can see that he is now so very much helping the Queen. Therefore, because of that role, people are responding much more positively. The Queen and the British public have also come around to the prospect of Camilla alongside Charles on the throne. The Queen recognises how good Camilla is for Charles, and with a stable woman alongside him, the crown is in very safe hands. As King, Charles will follow his mother's example. He also knows the monarchy needs to evolve to survive. Charles has spoken for a long time about having a slimmed down monarchy, and he will. Charles will come from a completely new perspective. There'll be a smooth transition, but it will be different. I think he will make a very good king. So many things have influenced him, his parents, his grandmother, and I think that all these things have gone to make him a very special man. Well, even from a very tender age, she's always known exactly what to say. The Queen's speeches in Triumph and Tragedy, brand new next Saturday at 9.20. Find out what life's like inside the world's most secretive state. It's Michael Palin in North Korea, Thursday at 9. And next, the tales behind the tunes. It's ABBA, secrets of their greatest hits.